Hi, this is John Marsalis, and this is a recreation of a talk I gave at the Mostly Lost Film Identification Workshop at the Library of Congress in June of 2018. I've made a few minor updates based on new information received since the original talk, but otherwise, this is about 99% the same as the original presentation. Mostly Lost was originally conceived as a film identification workshop, but the organizers quickly realized that you can't do that all day without burning out. So they decided to intersperse a number of presentations throughout the weekend. These tend to be scholarly, upbeat talks about silent film stars, directors, studios, or production policies. They are often a cheerful look back in time. They are presentations that enlighten and thrill you, leaving you feeling all warm and happy inside. Sadly, this is not one of those talks. This is a tale of misery, of loss, of destruction, and of corporate incompetence. If your mascara is prone to run, or if you forgot to take your Prozac today, you may want to check out some of the unidentified stills in the lobby, or chat with friends outside rather than subject yourself to the story I'm about to tell. I'm going to dig deep into a fairly esoteric topic that would probably be of little interest to anyone other than this audience, but it's mostly a depressing chronicle of loss. I'm going to look at the survival of the films Lon Chaney made at Universal prior to 1920. I'm obviously interested in Cheney, but as the biggest star that came out of Universal in the silent era, this can serve as an excellent example of how poor the survival rate from that period is. If the films of a major star like Cheney don't survive, imagine the fate of Pauline Bush, Murdoch McQuarrie, Dorothy Phillips, or Cleo Madison. In his book on American feature film survival, David Pierce documents the survival of American produced feature films at about 25%. A pitifully small number, but as you will see, some stars and directors fared better than that, and others fared much worse. Now, as many of you know, I have a day job as a scientist. And in genetics, it's difficult to get a high-level impression of what's happening when looking at 30,000 genes. So we created heat maps, images that quickly give a snapshot of what is happening at the gene level. Red is a gene turned off, green is turned on. It occurred to me that this might be a useful tool for getting a quick feel for film survival. Imagine that green means survives and red is lost. So for example, we can quickly get a feel for the 17 out of 346 Vitagraph features that survive today. Or the 16 out of 456 Biographs directed by D.W. Griffith that are lost. We can apply this to studios, directors, even comedy teams. Here is the survival of the films of Laurel and Hardy. And while some of you bemoan the approximately 1.9 films that are lost, the survival is extraordinary when compared with overall survival of films of this era. Which brings me to today's topic. I've divided the films of Lon Chaney into two categories. The films he made at Universal prior to 1920 and everything else. And everything else includes pre-1920 films he made at other studios, as well as post-1919 films that include his later Universal films. I'm not going to say much about this group of films because, in the context of film survival, this is a pretty boring topic. You can see that survival of these films, even the pre-1920 titles, is pretty good. Of 47 films, 26 are complete, Three are mostly complete, perhaps missing a reel or so, and seven survive as fragments. That means that over three quarters of these films survive in some form, and over 60% survive nearly complete. Again, a shocking contrast to the 25% overall silent film survival. But the pre-1920 universal survival is grim. Of 112 films, I'm not sure any are totally complete, but about a dozen are mostly complete. Five are over half complete, and three survive as fragments. This gives us survival of only about 10% close to complete, and 18% surviving in any form. Now this raises a valid question. Why 18% survival of the Universal Teens pictures versus 77% for everything else? You might think this is simply due to age. 
we would expect survival of 1929 nitrates to be better than those from 1913. But that isn't really it. Survival of his 1921 to 22 pictures at 58% is way better than the 13% survival from only four years earlier. Also, we are still turning up 1909 nitrate prints in reasonable condition in this decade, so age doesn't entirely explain it. What about policies of the individual studios Cheney worked for? This is certainly a factor, and it's well established that some studios were much more preservation-minded than others. MGM is probably the king of silent film preservation, with about 63% survival, and not surprisingly, 14 of Cheney's 18 MGM titles, 78%, survive. Paramount had a much spottier record, with 30% overall survival, and two of Cheney's four Paramounts survive. Likewise, Goldwyn had only 22% survival, and again, two of Cheney's four films survive. And that brings us to Universal. We know that survival of Universal features is poor, with only about 18% surviving today. But 15 of Cheney's 36 features for Universal, over 40%, survive today. Many of these are from 16 millimeter show at home prints released to the private market schools and libraries in the 20s and 30s. And I remind you that The Hunchback of Notre Dame and the original 1925 version of The Phantom of the Opera, arguably two of the most famous films of the silent era, would be completely lost today if not for show at home prints. So studio policies certainly affected overall film survival, but this also isn't the full story. Now, I know what you're thinking. We've all heard the story of how Universal junked all their silent pictures in the 1940s, and that story is indeed true. On April 27th of 1948, F.T. Murray, manager of branch operations for Universal, sent a letter to the vault manager at Universal's Boundbrook, New Jersey storage vaults, stating, quote, this is your authority to junk all silent negatives except the following. This was followed by a list of 17 titles, some with soundtracks, some without. Note that among these titles is The Kaiser, also known as The Kaiser, The Beast of Berlin, a major release that featured Cheney. That film is lost today, so presumably by 1948, this negative was already gone. But the vault manager complied returning an 18-page single-space list of all the destroyed negatives with the handwritten note, all junked at Woodridge, 6-9-1948. So surely this is what became of all the Cheney Universals. They were all junked by Universal. Except, in the destruction list, there are only five Cheney titles listed, and paid in advance survives elsewhere. So in the great Universal film junking of 1948, only four Cheney titles were destroyed. So age and studio policies are factors, and four Cheney titles were willfully destroyed. But that doesn't explain the loss of 82% of the films he made during that period. So what was the cause? In a word, fire. Many other studios had fires over the years, but Universal had a particularly bad run of luck. There were many significant fires between 1914 and 1927, with fires in studios, production facilities, labs, and storage vaults covering much of the U.S., with fires in New York City, Bayonne, New Jersey, Fort Lee, New Jersey, and Universal City in California. Let's take a look at some of these fires. The Colonial Hall fire destroyed Universal Studio on West 101st Street in New York City on May 13, 1914. This was an imp film company facility, and the article noted that about $300,000 worth of film, that's about 10,000 reels, were destroyed, including prints of Traffic and Souls, Neptune's Daughter, and Lucia Love. With this and many other fires, they note that only prints were destroyed, not negatives. But if the film had already made its theatrical run, you can assume that Universal didn't go back to strike backup prints for anything, leaving only the negative, a vulnerable position at best. I thought it would be fun for all of the fire sites I'm going to talk about to see what was there today. The site today is a series of apartment buildings. Reaction from public officials following this fire was swift and brutal. 
Six weeks later, the New York City Fire Department evicted Ramo Films, Photo Life Film, and Commercial Motion Picture Companies from this complex of buildings because they had not secured adequate permits and the buildings they were in were not considered safe for film production. Fire departments across the country began demanding greater fire protections for studios and, presumably, insurance premiums went up. The industry pushed back hard on this regulatory overreach, something that would, of course, never happen today. Universal responded with an editorial where Bert Adler, manager of the Coyotesville Studios, stated, quote, There is practically no fire danger from a picture studio. In the film factory, true, large quantities of film and chemicals are stored, but the average studio carries little of chemicals and only enough film for the cameraman to shoot from day to day. I know of only one strictly studio fire in the history of the industry. Yeah, it was your studio one year earlier. This would turn out to be a prophetically stupid statement from Universal Management because on January 18th of 1921, a facility shared by Universal and Cello Studios on Avenue E in Bayonne, New Jersey, had a major fire. Two people were killed and 11 were injured. The New York Times noted, quote, a series of minor explosions followed, which threw strips of blazing film long distances. Many of you have seen Serge Bromberg's demo of burning nitrate film in a can. Imagine him flinging it into the audience instead, and you get the picture. The article noted that, quote, One burning strip of celluloid set fire to the roof of the welding shop 100 feet away, where a 1,000 gallons of gasoline were stored. That can't have ended well. The quantity of film destroyed was not disclosed, but given the description of the fire, it's assumed to be substantial. The site today is residential houses. An interesting side note to the Bayonne fire. In April of 2004, a repairman was called to fix a collapsed sidewalk on Avenue E and uncovered a space under the sidewalk that contained three empty vaults once used to hold silent films. These were determined to be the vaults of Centaur Films, who had several locations in Bayonne, but they also formed a production company in Hollywood in 1911 that they called the Nestor Film Company, and Nestor became part of Universal in 1912 and was one of Cheney's early Universal production units. Moving west, Universal Studios had a major fire on May 24th of 1922 that destroyed 185,000 feet of film, including the work print of Under Two Flags. The article noted that, quote, Padlocked metal boxes of film exploded with the heat, showering the vicinity with steel splinters that embedded themselves in the walls. The LA Times article noted that Todd Browning, Priscilla Dean, Leo McCary, Arthur Ripley, and Irving Thalberg were all caught in the fire, but escaped unharmed. Seven months later, on December 23rd, there was another massive fire covered by both the New York Times and the LA Times. The article noted that Norman Carey, film editor Tom Malloy, art title department worker Fred Archer, and film cutters Edward Bush, Frank Atkinson, and Edward Curtis were all overcome by smoke and gas and needed medical attention. Norman Carey was portrayed as the hero of the event, working to save both lives and property. But I wonder if this is a side story planted by the publicity department to fit his heroic screen image. This fire destroyed 1,100 reels of film, including 35 to 40 films being edited, and they put the value of film lost at $100,000. Now, this calculates out to be about $0.09 cents a foot, but stock plus processing at the time was only about $0.03 cents a foot, so they may have tripled the stated value for insurance purposes. Universal had to cancel bookings for the next four weeks. The York Noroi series of shorts were among those destroyed, but again, the article notes that no negatives were lost. And we, of course, know what this site looks like today. And I'm happy to report that, relevant to this talk, Lon Chaney Drive is still open on the Universal Studios tour. Returning to the East Coast, Universal had a series of fires in and around their facilities in Fort Lee, New Jersey. A fire at a Universal storage facility on October 23, 1924, began with an explosion, probably of a nitrate vault, and damage was estimated to be around $100,000. The article cited stars like Mary Pickford, Ben Turpin, and Wallace Reed, whose films were lost. And this is the only instance I can find where anyone specifically called out films of Lon Chaney as being destroyed. The site today is a parking lot, but you can see there on the right a plaque commemorating this as a historic film site where Universal had their Fort Lee facility. 
On February 2nd, 1927, there was a second Fort Lee fire in the Universal Film storage sheds. This was a truly catastrophic fire, and the news reports put the loss at, quote, motion picture films worth several millions. We don't know the exact amount of film, but a $2 million loss would equate to about 22,000 reels of film using Universal's value estimation calculation. The total of all Universal silent feature films is about 5,700 reels. So this loss is either wildly overstated or it represents essentially the entire silent output of Universal Studios, features and shorts, prints and negatives. Les Miserables and Love Me in the World is Mine were the only two titles mentioned. There were two curious things about this article. The first was the statement that, quote, films destroyed included many old favorites, including Mary Pickford, Douglas Fairbanks, and others. Pickford worked at Imp, a universal company, but one wonders why Fairbanks films would be at a universal facility. The article also mentioned this as the second serious lab fire in two years. This led me to the Evans Laboratory fire of February 7th, 1925, almost exactly two years earlier. I found a news report of this event because a firefighter was killed battling the blaze, and the city later erected a historical marker in his memory. The National Evans Lab, as it was known, was built to support the Willett Film Manufacturing Company at the corner of Linwood and Main Street. The lab did work for Triangle, Fox, and Universal, so the Triangle Lab work explains the Fairbanks reference. The film losses are unknown, but as this was a lab supporting Universal, we assume that some negatives were lost. The site today is a series of apartments. Finally, no story of Universal Fires is complete without this footnote. A news report noted that, quote, Universal is coming to terms with what it lost in Sunday's fire. The studio sent out memos to film bookers on Tuesday that stated nearly 100% of the archive prints kept here on the lot were destroyed. A prominent film booker of the time was quoted as saying, This is a catastrophe on general principle. Universal was our principal supplier for the last few years. This will affect all of us for years to come. When was this fire? 1928? 31? 34? No. It was on June 1st of 2008 in a vault where all of the archive projection prints were kept, and the quote was from none other than Mike Schlesinger. With all this decomposition, destruction, and lots and lots of fires, one wonders why anything from this period survived, and the answer is simple. Exports. While eight films were found in the U.S., the majority were not. Six turned up in the U.K., two in the Yukon, and one each in France, the Netherlands, Germany, and the Czech Republic. And none of these survived due to the efforts of Universal or any other film studio, but rather were discovered by collectors and projectionists. Let's do a quick survey of what turned up and where. Starting in the U.S., three of five reels of Triumph was found in L.A. by collector George Wagner. A fragment of Tangled Hearts was found by USC archivist Dino Everett. Two of three reels of A Mother's Atonement was in the Nichols Collection, a Seattle-based collector, and the collection was subsequently purchased by Library of Congress. A short fragment of The Millionaire Poppers was turned up in Minneapolis by collector Rusty Castleton. Three of five reels of The Grasp of Greed and essentially all of Broadway Love were in collections donated to George Eastman House. A nearly complete print of The Scarlet Car was donated to the Library of Congress, and my personal favorite story, the oubliette was found under a front porch of a house during a renovation in Georgia in 1983. We give thanks to our friends from across the pond in the UK for many important finds. A nearly complete print of The Lion, the Lamb, and the Man was found in 2008 by Bob Gehagen at Archive Film Agency in London, the most recent Cheney find. Poor Jake's Demise, Cheney's first billed appearance in films, was found by Dick Heyman in Thaden Boys and subsequently purchased as part of a large nitrate collection by Serge Bromberg. By the Sun's Rays was turned up by Breakspear Films in Leek in the 1970s and put out in Super 8mm to collectors. Most of Dolly's Scoop and Alas and Alack were donated to the BFI by various collectors. And a fragment of the fascination of the Fleur de Lis was found in the hands of a British collector, but Kevin Brownlow didn't remember how or where. 
We all know the story of the film was found buried under the Yukon permafrost in 1978, an event well chronicled by the recent Dawson City Frozen Time documentary, so I won't reiterate the details here, but among those films were two Cheneys, three of five reels of If My Country Should Call, and four of five reels of The Place Beyond the Winds, and these were subsequently donated to the Library of Congress. I will put in a shameless plug for a recent DVD I produced and scored featuring these two films and The Mother's Atonement that Ben Modell is selling through his Undercrank label. And finally, in Europe, four Cheneys turned up in archives. The Price of Silence at Archive du Film de C.M.C., The Wicked Darling at the I Institute in the Netherlands, The Tragedy of Whispering Creek at the Dutch Kinematheque in Germany, and Paid in Advance at the Czech Film Archive, with Czech titles, of course. This raises the ultimate question. Is there more out there? While I like to remain optimistic, I don't feel the odds are good. We were finding several films a decade from this period in the 70s and 80s, and a couple turned up in the 1990s. One film was found in 2008, and none have turned up since. Decomposition, studio policies, and fire all contributed to a staggering loss of films of the team's universal players and directors, and continued finds of the likes of Dawson City seem increasingly remote, but we can still hope. Before switching to a video format, I want to pause to thank several people who helped with this presentation. Special thanks to Richard Kazarski and David Pierce, who provided invaluable details of universal fires and destruction policies. Also, thanks to George Wagner, Kevin Brownlow, and Serge Bromberg for sharing details of some of their finds. I also want to make another shameless plug, this time for my website, lonchaney.org, where you can learn more about both the lost and found Cheney titles from his entire career. In closing, I regret that this has mostly been a tale of woe, a story of decomposition, fire, destruction, the equivalent of a cinematic holocaust. But despite this sad missive I've delivered, we have to be thankful for what did survive, a small but extraordinary sampling of films showing the growth of a prominent actor in his formative years. As with the Michael Apted Up series, we literally get to watch Lon Chaney mature before our eyes, evolving from a slapstick bit player to a cinematic icon. With apologies for some of the prints, which range from 2K scans from nitrate to third-generation VHS dupes, let's take a look.